Reports of mysterious individuals referred to as men in black are prevalent worldwide. These enigmatic figures, whether they are government agents, otherworldly entities, or extraterrestrial beings, are believed to have a singular purpose, to stifle the efforts of those engaged in UFO research, and maintain a shroud of secrecy around the existence of extraterrestrial life and their hidden agendas. In today's episode, we are talking about five such cases involving UFOs and men in black. On 3 August, 1965, Rex Heflin, a 38-year-old former police officer, was performing his duties as a highway maintenance engineer for the Orange County Road Department on the Santa Ana Freeway in Southern California. He encountered an unusual situation when several trees obscured a railroad crossing sign, potentially endangering motorists. In an attempt to notify his supervisor, Heflin found his radio unexpectedly malfunctioning. While seated in his work van, attempting to establish communication, Heflin observed an extraordinary sight in the sky, a 20-foot-wide, hat-shaped aircraft cruising at an altitude of roughly 150 feet, which he promptly captured with his Polaroid camera, typically used for his job. As the unidentified craft drew nearer, Heflin reported witnessing a greenish-white, rotating beam of light emanating from its underside. He managed to take two additional photographs. While observing the object through his van's passenger window, Heflin noticed it exhibiting a peculiar wobbling motion as it gradually ascended, eventually stabilizing. Subsequently, the craft accelerated both in velocity and altitude, leaving behind a cloud of smoke-like vapor before vanishing, leaving a bluish-black smoke ring in its wake. Heflin pursued the smoke ring and succeeded in capturing a fourth and final photograph before it dissipated. Initially, Heflin presumed the aircraft to be an experimental vehicle from the nearby El Toro Marine Base. Consequently, he did not attach much significance to the images and refrained from discussing the incident until he shared the photos with a few colleagues at his Santa Ana office. Their reactions, however, suggested that what Heflin had documented might not be an experimental aircraft but rather something far more unconventional, potentially of extraterrestrial origin. Despite initial skepticism, Heflin kept the images to himself for a period. Eventually, he lent the original photographs to his sister, leading to their public display in a Santa Ana pharmacy. It was there that the publisher and co-owner of the Santa Ana Register newspaper encountered them and requested permission to borrow the originals for publication, hesitant and still thinking the pictures showed a special plane from El Toro, Heflin finally said okay for the newspaper to copy the pictures. Six weeks later, they put the photos in the newspaper. After that, UFO researchers got interested. They didn't agree with Heflin. They thought the thing in the pictures was from space, not a special plane. Also, the El Toro Marine base said the thing in the pictures wasn't from their base. And they hadn't heard about it before. The researchers wanted to see the real pictures, so they asked Heflin. But Heflin told them they couldn't because a government person already took them. At the end of September, some scientists came to Heflin. They wanted to check the pictures too. But before that, Marine Corps people had come to Heflin's house. They talked to him and took the first three pictures to make copies. After that, the U.S. Air Force also contacted Heflin. They asked him many questions for more than three hours, and they took the real pictures again for more checking, later, they gave the pictures back, and the U.S. Air Force sent a report to Project Blue Book. Even though the report said Heflin wasn't lying, Project Blue Book said the pictures were lies. But still, many people were curious about Heflin's pictures. On September 20th, a person who said he was a NORAD, North American Aerospace Defense Command colonel called Heflin. They agreed to meet two days later. During the call, the man told Heflin not to talk about the event to the news. By then, Heflin was used to the government wanting to see his pictures because they thought he took pictures of a secret plane. So, on the evening of the 22nd, two men came to Heflin's house. They said they were from NORAD. Oddly, 
They were wearing regular dark suits, not military clothes. But one of the men had a folder with papers and an ID card that looked like what El Toro Marines have. Heflin couldn't remember the name on the ID, but it was strange because it didn't have a picture. The other man didn't talk or do anything. When they left, they took the real pictures, and Heflin didn't ask for a receipt. He thought he'd get the pictures back because he'd already dealt with the Marine Corps and the Air Force, but they never gave the pictures back. Later, when Heflin asked Norad about his missing pictures, they replied in writing, saying they aren't responsible for checking UFOs or collecting UFO pictures. Basically, Norad said they didn't know anything about Heflin and couldn't have taken his photos. Heflin was confused. He wondered where his pictures went and who those mysterious suit-wearing men were. Things got even weirder about two years later. On October 11, 1967, Heflin said a man in a U.S. Air Force uniform named Captain C.H. Edmonds showed up at his house. Just like the NORAD agents from before, the man's ID card had no photo. What's more, Heflin noticed a strange purple light coming from the car the man had parked about 30 feet away. The car was a dark blue 1965 or 1966 Chevy with unreadable dark lettering on the door. While Heflin talked to the captain, he thought he saw someone else in the car's back seat, watching him, Heflin said the conversation with the captain was strange. The captain asked about the Bermuda Triangle and kept asking personal questions. Heflin felt uncomfortable and wondered if he was being filmed by the person in the car. After the captain left, strange things kept happening. It seemed like Heflin's phone was being tapped, and his neighbor told him that Marine Corps and Air Force officers had been snooping around his home while he was at work. Angry about his privacy being invaded, Heflin told the Air Force about these intrusions. The Air Force said they had nothing to do with it and even wrote a memo about someone impersonating Air Force officers. There was no record of a Captain C.H. Edmonds ever going to Heflin's house. Over many years, nobody could figure out who those odd men in fancy suits were or where they came from. Also, no one could say for sure what Heflin saw that day above the Santa Ana freeway. Even though some people said his pictures were fake, a lot of researchers believed they showed real UFOs. Many folks and magazines thought they were some of the best UFO photos ever taken. But the strange stuff didn't stop there. In 1993, Heflin, who was pretty sick by then and lived somewhere else, got a call from a lady he didn't know. She asked him, have you looked in your mailbox recently? Then, she hung up before he could answer. When Heflin checked his mailbox, he found a plain brown envelope with no postage marks. Inside were the original Polaroid photos he took. It was a big surprise because it had been almost 30 years, and suddenly, they were back in his hands. In April 2008, Raven Mendel, a well-known expert in studying mysterious creatures, a writer, and a radio host, talked about a strange and unsettling experience in her life. She said that unusual things started happening when she began researching unidentified flying objects, UFOs, more seriously. This all began on April 16, 2008, at around 5.30 in the evening. Two men dressed entirely in black emerged from an apartment across the street from where she lived with her husband at that time. What made this even stranger was that no one was supposed to be living in that apartment, and their appearance was completely unexpected. Outside, Mendel watched as these two black-clad men walked away from the apartment and headed towards a black car parked at the side of the road. As they passed by Mendel, she noticed they were staring at her with emotionless faces, giving her an eerie feeling. Naturally, this made her curious, and she moved closer to the Lincoln car to see their license plate. But as she approached, the men apparently quickly backed out and sped away, Mendel believed that they intentionally did this, and her interest in them had frightened them off. After this unsettling encounter, her life and her family's life took a turn for the worse. They began receiving repeated phone calls with no one on the other end. Strange whispers echoed through their apartment, along with other eerie, 
ghostly occurrences. On one occasion, Mendel claimed to have discovered large, unusual handprints on her bathroom mirror and even found bruises on her daughter that matched those handprints after she had taken a shower. The scary situation wasn't just in her home, it followed her when she walked her dog. Mendel said a black car followed her closely during her walk. There was an older man driving and a younger man in the passenger seat who watched her as she walked. They even parked very close to her, as if they wanted her to know they were watching her. After these experiences, Mendel felt scared not only when she was awake but also when she slept. She had terrible nightmares, like one night when she felt like her whole body was getting squished, and there was a loud noise in her ear. This went on until she decided to stop researching UFOs. It scared me enough to not want to learn more, she said. I got the message, and I won't mess with UFOs anymore, for Mendel, this scary incident changed her life. The fear, she said, is still there. Jan Ove Sundberg, a famous Swedish freelance journalist, was well known for investigating mysterious creatures from legends all over the world. He liked to call himself a monster hunter. During his career, he wrote a lot about strange sea creatures, organized many trips to find them, and appeared in many TV shows and films. In 2011, when he passed away, he gave all his research stuff to the archives for the unexplained in Sweden, one of the things he left behind was a story from the early days of his career in 1971, in Loch Ness, Scotland. On August 14, 1971, Sundberg was walking in a forest near Foyers Bay at Loch Ness when he saw something unusual. It was dark grey, about 30 feet long, shaped like a cigar, and had a big part on top that looked like a handle. As he watched, he saw three creatures come out of the forest and walk towards the strange object. These creatures were grey and wore special suits for diving. At first, Sunbird thought they were people exploring the nearby lake. But when they went into the object through a door and then it flew away silently, he realized they were not from Earth. Despite having a camera with him, Sunbird couldn't capture a clear picture. He felt frozen when he saw what seemed like aliens. Still, he did manage to snap one photo as the craft flew away. A group of UFO enthusiasts in Scandinavia checked the picture, but they couldn't figure out what it was. Dr. James Harder, a researcher, has the last known copy of this photo, Sundberg sent it to him for more study, but the story doesn't stop there. It might actually be the start of a very important time in Sundberg's life. When he got back home to Sweden, he started feeling like men in black were bothering him. Weird footprints appeared in his garden, like someone was checking his property. He got strange phone calls from odd people, and his house had spooky things happening, like objects moving on their own. Some people even say the men in black made Sunberg so stressed that he had a nervous breakdown. Stanislav Moskalenko was a skilled Soviet fighter pilot in the 1980s. His job was to protect Soviet borders from nearby enemy planes that frequently intruded into Soviet territory. One day, Moskalenko was sent to intercept a suspicious aircraft in his superfast fighter jet. However, this aircraft turned out to be unusual. Another plane sent ahead couldn't see it visually or on radar. It was ordered to return, but before Moskalenko got the same order, a ground control tower suddenly spotted the target. But he still couldn't see it, control instructed him to fly towards where the radar showed the target. He understood this as a sign to intercept the mysterious craft. But how could he do that if he couldn't see it? As he flew towards the supposed location, a brief fog surrounded his jet's canopy. Control then urgently told him that the object was right below him, he quickly turned his plane downward, but there was nothing there. Finally, he saw a craft moving near the ground from left to right. The controller, Captain Oleg Kazunin, reported that at that moment, the blip on the radar turned into a large dot and zoomed away faster than a missile. During this strange encounter, 
Moskalenko's vision became unclear, and he saw unusual images of fires and blurry masks. When he regained his senses, he realized that he had been ascending, not descending as he thought, for the next three days, Moskalenko's squadron attempted to chase this mysterious target but couldn't catch it. They even asked Moscow for secret equipment to help, but nothing worked, and eventually, they gave up the pursuit. However, Moskalenko's tale didn't just conclude right there. In 1990, while chatting about the incident with his buddy Major Oleg Belomestinov, something truly strange and scary supposedly took place right in the middle of their conversation. Suddenly, out of the blue, Moskalenko was struck hard in the back, sending him tumbling to the ground. Then, in a rather bizarre twist, Moskalenko supposedly floated horizontally a few feet above the ground before dramatically crashing back down, Belomestinov rushed to his aid, helping him to his feet. Moskalenko was in a daze and wobbly on his feet, utterly bewildered by what had just occurred. As they began their journey home, Moskalenko claimed to have seen blurry, unfamiliar landscapes in his confused state. What's even more peculiar is that, out of nowhere, a short, slender, and scruffy-looking man dressed in black suddenly appeared and blocked their path. Both men saw him, this mysterious figure apparently warned Moskalenko that he might face another powerful attack. Oddly, this man in black seemed to communicate with Moskalenko through thoughts alone, paying no attention to Belomestinov's attempts to engage with him. The enigmatic man then approached Moskalenko and touched his swollen leg with his hand. After a sudden surge of intense heat, the pain vanished, along with the strange visions. And just as mysteriously as he had appeared, the man in black disappeared, Major Belomestinov, despite never believing in UFOs, claimed to have verified the story when it was later reported to the authorities. Both he and Muskalenko had witnessed the man in black. However, the true identity of this mysterious man in black and his connection to the ghostly UFO remains shrouded in mystery, as it has never been uncovered. Jenny Randalls, a person who used to work for the British UFO Research Association and write books about strange things, has written more than 50 books about topics like weird crop circles, time travel, ESP, and what happens after we die. She is known for being open to weird stuff. But in 1997, when she wrote about a thing called Men in Black, there was one story that really confused her. She said it was the weirdest, men in black, story she ever heard, maybe even the weirdest story of any kind she ever heard. For Randalls, this strange story started on December 4, 1987. That's when she got a letter from a man who used a fake name, Philip Spencer, because he didn't want people to know who he was. He wanted Randalls' help because he had a weird experience on December 1st, just three days earlier. He was walking on a place called Ilkley Moor in England, around 7.45 in the morning. He was going to take some pictures of the landscape and visit a relative, like a regular trip. But as he got close to a village called East Morton, he saw something strange, he saw a weird green figure on some rocks, and this figure had a big head. According to his letter, this green figure kind of signaled to him, so he quickly took a picture with his camera. Then, he watched as this strange green thing moved behind some rocks and disappeared. He tried to follow it but then saw a round thing in the sky that shot up really fast. He forgot about his camera, when he got back to where people live, he noticed that the time was different from what he thought. When he was walking, it was around 7.45 am, but the church clock said it was 10 am. That means more than two hours had disappeared somehow. This freaked him out, so he took a bus to a nearby town to develop the pictures from his camera. And guess what? The picture of the weird green figure actually came out. At first, Randalls was impressed by Spencer's letter. Even though the story was super strange, he seemed like a normal, sensible person who didn't want attention or money. He was mostly worried about keeping his reputation as a former police officer. Randalls told him it was really important to test the picture properly, but he never wrote back to her. 
It seemed like the case had gone cold until Randalls found out that Spencer had talked to another researcher and even spoke with Spencer on the phone, as Randalls looked more into the case, she noticed something weird. Spencer was super calm and didn't seem to care much about the strange stuff he saw, even though he had proof. Despite the story sounding crazy, Randalls and another researcher, Peter Huff, checked the picture, and they were sure it wasn't fake. But they couldn't figure out what the green figure in the picture was. In March 1988, a few months later, Spencer agreed to do hypnosis with a psychologist. During this, he remembered something he had forgotten. He said he was taken by the green creature from the moors. He talked about floating in the air, feeling weird, and seeing a big silver thing with a door he didn't want to go into. He also talked about two movies the aliens showed him, one of them was about destruction, and he couldn't talk about the other one, this made the case even weirder because Spencer was really scared during hypnosis. Even the psychologist thought what he said was real. This explained why the time was different when he got back from the moors, in January 1988, while a photographer was looking at Spencer's picture, two men said they were from the Ministry of Defense visited Spencer. They stayed at his house for almost an hour, asking about what he saw and wanting the negative of his picture. But what's strange is Spencer never told them about the picture, yet they knew about it. When he couldn't find the negative, they left quickly. This is the end of today's episode, please like, comment, and share the episode with your friends. Also subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell, I will see you soon, with another mysterious episode, take care.